Hello everyone, today we talk about the 6th century Roman composite bow. So it's a bit of a technical video, we won't be discussing the actual shooting techniques, which we will see in another video, nor we will talk specifically about Roman archers um, during this time. That's the topic for another video as well, but concentrating a bit on the, um, let's, let's say, on the mechanics and on the composition naturally uh, as well. We don't have an overwhelming amount of evidence but fundamentally you know what we're talking about here, two simple distinctions. The, 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 the typical European bow was built since prehistory in the same identical way forever. right? Uh, the composite one stemming from, from, from the, the Eurasian steps fundamentally was essentially more powerful as we see and naturally it derived these qualities from its composition um, so that that would make it more elastic and uh, therefore you could draw it um, with greater force without breaking it. Uh, during the 6th century the Roman Empire is heavily influenced by steppes warfare. We have discussed this here and there but basically the uh, the empire we're looking at now gravitates fundamentally what would, was previously the eastern uh, uh, half and uh, Constantinople. This is important re-expansion during Justinian times in the west but let's say that the, the core of the Byzantine military it was however augmented importantly with a lot of foreign populations including ones coming from the steppes here, I don't know, the Huns were quite common still, um, uh, had assumed this more Pontic character. Uh, I say this because properly um, this this is a broader change in the political and strategical horizons of, of the empire, but um, ancient authors um, looking at the Pontus Euxenus, the Black Sea, um, said, uh, because of the peoples that inhabited in the, in the northern shores, in today's Ukraine, the steppe, that curiously, the form of the, uh, of the sea looked like um, a bow, in fact, and uh, with the with the with the bow proper, uh, essentially overlapping the uh, the Anatolian shore, and, and then the string pulled somewhere from you know north of Crimea, um, and the th this is also because the original composite bow that mm, Europeans, let's say Western Europeans, and Mediterranean comes to know is uh, of Scythian origin. Right. Eventually, there are other types that we will see now. There are fundamentally the Hunnic, the uh, the Avar, and also the Sasanian bows that do not vary dramatically, but they are fundamentally also an implementation of the previous bows. There is all uh, uh, steps technology there that evolves over time. Today we won't cover that, but fundamentally, with these uh, during the migration here and therefore these waves of populations that mostly impacted from, from the Eurasian steppes, the eastern part of the empire, the Danubian frontier, but also the eastern one, I mean, looking at, at the Near East and just to contact with the Sasanians, but this broader you know, Cauc Caucasian area was massively influenced by steppes peoples in general. Um, the, what people call the Eastern Romans, improper, but um, it, sometimes it's better Byzantines, as you know, to, to, to avoid misunderstandings, um, were massively <coughs> integrating these guys in their army. And uh, sometimes we look at Eastern Roman archers and say, you know, th that is like uh, or identical to uh, an archer of the steppes. Well, sometimes in the sense that the Romans came to eventually copy that model, right, that wasn't part of the typically, you know, of the sedentary areas where the empire had developed, so it's kind of an artificial one, but sometimes we're talking literally about the same people, meaning that um, the same mercenaries uh, that were sometimes even settled down and would be Romanized along front within the imperial boundaries were essentially specialized in this, and there is um, naturally also a regression of the sedentary areas at this point, there are these new ways of peoples that sometimes settled within the borders without even you know, permission, or at least being granted just afterwards, they had settled, keeping to leave like that. There is a tra tradition, maybe if you look at Trace, uh, that is just next door to Constantinople, that where you see the Thracians that inhabited the eastern shore of the Danube were more 
kind of infantry base. The the western ones actually uh, they had a freaking lot of horse archers because from Dobruja, the 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 uh, then eventually the, the Danubian uh, estuary in the north of Istria um, in, opened to the steppes, and that that corridor that reaches eventually the Pannonian plain was mm, crossed for millennia for these kinds of populations. So that's how by osmosis the Romans come to adopt in this moment where the the balance is shifted dramatically east compared to you know early imperial times. This kind of war size, including the, the bow and the, the equipment. What is interesting here is that um, the bow wasn't, of course, just a, uh, let's say, as we've seen, a, a steps um, prerogative. Uh, it had been absorbed by also other people. So the Germans, for example, during the migration era have, uh, you know, the lower classes are all fundamentally armed with bows. The same goes with the Roman infantry, in a sense. The bow... Toxon, in Greek, um, used by Roman infantrymen, um, for example, was very common, um, and uh, all Roman troopers were fundamentally trained with it for a longer time. What is often overlooked is that in later Roman times, the individual training of soldiers increased dramatically, um, also the collective one in a sense, but meaning that these guys were uh, at least, let, let's say, bow became the most common weapon to, to to find around um, in uh, at least in also considering the, the devastating efforts this this could have of course um, this doesn't mean that bows by themselves arrows by themselves made difference in battle right it, it was always about combined arms shock and mm, you know uh, missile tactics alternated to wear the enemy out here there is all a broader reason why it was a shift towards that, that kind of tactic that is in itself more effective, right? With the contraction of, of, of let's say, of imperial resources over time, of course, uh, there was an investment in, in those things that, you know, work best in qualitative terms. And that's another thing that is often overlooked, that times of crisis do not really mean um, decline uh, at all levels. Um, but... Uh, on the contrary, especially from a technological point of view, that is not the one that makes the absolute difference, but is, let's say, a, a consequence of this broader search for, for, a, for a quality increase. There is, you know, something that makes its effect. As we'll see, uh, the composite bow performance is, is pretty damn good, right? It made its, uh, it, its work, but we have to remember that in spite of the lack of um, uh, widespread lack of armor that troops were facing at this time. We know that Belisarius um, horsemen, uh, knights, proper, who were to, you know, ideally heavy cavalry, in Italy had to use wooden armor because there, there was a metal around. I mean, it, we're talking about very rough times. But So the bow is a kind of a poor weapon, but it's very effective. It's one of the most ancient in the history uh, of mankind. After the javelin, fundamentally, you know, the bow becomes uh, an incredible uh, tool to deliver at an astonishing distance and with good precision, an, an important, important um, destructive capacity, uh, and uh, in terms of penetration, therefore, you know, damage to to the target in that sense, uh, and therefore it was easy to keep people like with, with that. Right is also another reason why there could be widespread use of um, of the, 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 the bows, arrows, material that also must not be just though the the, the word you know, there were infinite ammo or something like that. That those costed a freaking lot too. So always consider the the broader economy of this. Um infantrymen usually uh had their their bows carried slung over their shoulder. They had this this con combined container called toxopharetra in Greek that contained also a, a quiver proper, the kukura, which is a term of actually Germanic origin. Um, with 30 or 40 arrows, mm -hmm. uh, which is an optimum and is a good number, telling you the truth. So the horseman bow said was usually carried in a in a case known as tekion or tekarion, or a half case, the emi tekion, that was fastened to the saddle. Um, and part of the individual. Uh, provision of the of of the of the soldier, the individual soldier were at least two strings 
called neuras or cordas, right? It's like the etymology is the one of our nerves and cord, cord chords, I don't know, saying in English. Um, and, of course, uh, these were the uh, spare strings with the, the, the one that the bow had broke, so it makes three at the end of the day. And also a little file to sharpen the arrows. Uh, Consider these troops tended um, with the broader decline of the saddle machine, uh, or at least the passage into private hands of certain forms of supplies. Think about the Buccellari, etc. They were, you know, also largely horse archers. In, um, but, by, by, you know, the same soldiers that, of course, created their own, um, their own armor sometimes. Um, the bow of the Roman horsemen, <coughs> in this sense, was presumably similar to the infantry one, right? But we think it was generally of more reduced size to grant its usage on horseback. Uh, this is obvious, I would say, also considering that on horseback you can be far, far less precise, especially if you are on on the move, right? Which probably doesn't make this huge difference, but the the times you're shooting standing firm on foot are definitely greater uh, and more frequent than, than, than on horseback. Therefore, the, sa the sake of precision that uh, a, a, you know, a larger bow can, can offer um, and is, you know, is, is better suited for somebody who, who can make good use of it when standing firm. Otherwise, there is just a compromise uh, that can be seen in cavalry in this sense between the handling um, and of course, uh, on horseback you also have to cope with the fact you have the, the freaking horse head in the middle, as we see his back. You you're also, m say, more reduced in movements. In spite of course, these these horsemen were able to perform uh, dramatically well um, on horseback, also because they were getting ever more acquainted. As we've seen, these guys were sometimes the same ones, you know, ra ra raised in, in the steps. But even the lifestyle of an average, I don't know. Byzantine subject would get into the military and would, on that task, you know, through training and maybe even formal practice in that sense would be okay. Because at the end of the day, as we were saying before, there are certain areas of the empire now that are coming back to be kind of wilder because of contra demographic contractions. So, so people literally go live more in the countryside. They are also they were, there are also dangerous places sometimes. So that kind of bit of a militarization and even privatization of these capacities that in earlier times were controlled more by the state now is is more it's more spread um, but by the sixth century you would see let's say uh, a typical Byzantine horseman as mount right and what it's important to stress in here is that more or less we often overlook this but we we maybe didn't come to, to talk about that uh, from a while uh, about, but I mean the idea that we we think mostly at horse archery is something um, typically you know you know as a this this Pontic prerogative steps steps or Eastern prerogative, it's not entirely true that he used to say even if in in Western Europe for example or even places like North Africa or even Arabia right um, the Mediterranean the, there wasn't like a you know typical. Uh, horse archery tradition well during the migration here we see that this first of all gets you know everywhere right you can find horse archers every freaking where but especially we overlooked that there had always been right that even the peoples that we see as more uh, let's say on foot and more uh, you know hand to hand combat not even think about the Germans typically Right, the idea that they didn't develop much of a uh, archery technology, that they were more mostly about this path and foot combat. Well, yeah, but we see, even aside from the the easternmost Germans here, that are very, very influenced by steppe warfare. I mean, look at the Goths, at the Longobards, and so on. Um, even if you go, I don't know, in Francia, among the Merovingians, I mean, an average Frankish commerce would be a very skilled horse archer, if anything, because these guys lived as noblemen of hunting on the road. So every every knight, even in medieval times, would perfectly be skilled to, to be a horse archer. The fact that they fought differently on the field, it's because they found 
better better solutions given the, their political and social background but that doesn't tell much in terms of individual skills whether they could use that or not so you have to pick actually a you know a standard arimanus i don't know or even if you go in the in the far north in scandinavia right where we see even but even in the Jutland peninsula where we see you know that that there was kind of the less developed kind of of of, of military compared to the continental standards. Well, we see there that still the the hero, right, of the early sagas, that he's a guy on horseback that handles every kind of bow, fundamentally, including long bows, um, and that is able to switch from mounted to foot. Come, I mean, it, it it was like that, right? In terms of individual training, knowing how to use a bow was was very very common in in the in the sixth century military, right? So at least, uh, and this naturally overlapped with civilian life as well. So as a consequence, the Romans were facing people so that were and another knew how to, to use these things. I mean, look, go, if you go to the, the Museum of Cividale, you find the first longbirds settled in the Italian peninsula that were incidentally auxiliaries used by the Byzantines in the same Gothic War. At that point, the Goths were also, you know, they had good cavalry and were influenced by the Huns, by Eastern Archer and so on. Um, there, there are the entire there, there are the bodies of entire of, of of the warriors and of of the horses and their gear. So those are freaking horse archers, right? And, and there is no doubt about that. So um, all those capacities, including the zootechnic question was, I mean, you, knowing how to use a bow on horseback, that now as we're saying is consistently different from u- using it, at least in, by certain standards, on foot is is a big deal. Right, because you have to cope with consistent numbers of these guys, and therefore you have to match them on even, uh, uh, even level. And the Germans were the least from that point of view. Face, I don't know, the Avars, right? Face the Huns. Those guys, it's what what they've done since they their kids. Like they had literally spent a lifetime in horseback. So, um, and it's it's astonishing how by the sixth century, still the Roman military has this incredible capacity to basically to match everybody on, on their same grounds. That is where things work still and they definitely the also the, this more rather than Roman but more Byzantine kind of fusion between Roman and Hellenic mindset, relative you know, the Roman practicality, pragmatism and Hellenic, you know, uh, intelligence, say rationale and, you know, intellectual superiority. I mean produced uh, as it's exemplified by the strategic and this time the some of the greatest military cultures of the time, right? And this speaks for the highest levels of competence of the Roman military still, and of course, by the 6th century, this nobody out there in, in the world thought, I mean, in the world, as far as the, the Roman sphere of influence was, that the Romans were not the, the top military of the time. Of course, a very proud people, uh, independent, what would think they, they could match them, but not that those were, you know, less than, much less than, than at least, you know. Um, but, uh, and it's fascinating when we will be talking specifically of, of archery training, and in part I think we already done, we already made that video. We'll see, we, we've seen there, how, in fact, how um, thoroughly the Byzantine mm, sources, usually also manuals that were directed at, that, that from, where, where in terms of archery training. I mean, they, they literally made incredible tests that, fascinatingly enough, reveal the, the same exact data with an astonishing amount of precision of the modern tests, which is actually a pat on each other's shoulders at 1,500 years of difference to see that the way we test that thing and the way they test them now, right, was, uh, is alike, right, at least for, you know, people that are not relatively competent, but we also have examples of guys at the time, of course, that knew how to use the bow in ways that a modern person extrapolated from, the, from, from that concept could never do, right? It's like when they made weapons, right? They, metallurgy for our standards back in the day sucked, but out of ten swords they made, that nine were so-so, one was, was achieved with uh, a certain ergonomy and functionality that today, not even today with our dramatically more advanced technological means we are ever able to replicate in order for using that thing to to actually fight with it. So a lot of respect for the astonishing empirical 
the capacities of this guy to to achieve uh, great technological fits for, for those time standards. Um, so talking about the the stats of briefly of these bow, fundamentally an arrow shot by an average composite bow went something like 51 meters per second. It had uh, a maximum that, that is not useful uh, a range of 250 meters. Uh, tests that are exactly once I was mentioning a bow because they were uh, done exactly by these guys at the time um, suggest initial speeds of 200, 183 kilometers per hour, kilometers per hour which is really uh, you know a short range that's what that that tells you even you know the, the impact that, that was devastating um, and uh, yeah that's pretty much it to give an idea. Um, I would digress briefly on, on, on one point then that, you know, re some year ago I've seen that it was uh, a bit of, went very uh, popular viral out there by a reenactor that showed uh, medieval archery, I don't remember even what kind of bow that was, um, I didn't think he had anything to do with, it wasn't a composite one, but that fundamentally showed this incredible feats of, you know, shooting an astonishing amount of arrows in a uh, you know, uh, equally astonishing in proportional terms amount of time, uh, even with a certain degree of accuracy in a short range, right? And we know exactly from from six centuries or from these sources of that time, right around, that there were people who were capable of doing that. Was one guy basically um, drew the, the shape of of a uh, of a boy that stood behind a shield by essentially shooting at the, the margins of, of the guy's um, silhouette, let's say, and reproducing a drawing on the guy. Uh, that's, it, it's surely possible. It can be done. If you train just for that, um, and considering the risk involved, that's surely an impressive individu individual feat. But what uh, that means is absolutely not that, that that's a military useful thing. Right, militarily speaking, what what really matters is the order of the uh, the alternation of the salvos, let's say, of the shots all together collectively. Right, that is not aimed at precision. Right, of course, if you are in, in a skirmish in an ambush, you are you know a small pocket, uh, you know a handful of guys shooting against each other. Yes, you have to be very precise. At that point, those skills are going to be um, useful in a sense, but in more regular battles, what, what really matters is how uh, consistently you deliver uh, the, 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 the bow shots all at once and repeating that, right, uh, or a certain amount of time in coordination with other units that are going to exploit the disorder that that concentration of, of arrows can produce, right? So don't think that a guy was able to perform those feats uh, is something much different from just what they would do in the circus at the time. Right, because what happened on the field is something completely different in terms of what you can actually accomplish, right? And it's difficult enough to make people realize the difference between individual and collective uh, training. Well, that's exactly the point, right? Uh, you can't be uh, th an astonishingly tr trained archer, but having basically no use in an actual field, if uh, considering the, the 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 minimality of your presence among thousands of men that are making a difference by cooperating collectively and you know where are you going to be there when there are 10,000 arrows flying uh, you know uh, on, on a battlefield in in in, uh, in 20 minutes like it, it's it's difficult to say right um, and um, this this is extremely but it's possibly the most important thing to bear in mind when thinking of, of archery uh, in those times uh, so starting from the 5th century uh, the classical Scythian type bow that was employed by the Romans at that point had been cited uh, up to being completely substituted by the more powerful in handling Hannic bow. Mm -hmm. The, the Scythian type was uh, the Sigma type. It was a symmetric bow, and you know what the point of these these bows is? That basically they they when you you stretch them, they went backwards, um, were compared to the uh, the sense where they they curved uh, to when they, they bent to when they were 
released, right? So that tells you how you know much they were they were broke. Um, the the Hunnic type was asymmetric, though, uh, which means that the at least in, in in this case the inferior limb was shorter than the uh, superior one. Why? The archer on horseback could handle more easily the bow without interfering with the back of the horse, right? And even by making rapid uh, switches in the direction of the shot. So obviously, this is the point. You're you're not um, you, you don't want to have a lot of bending part of the bow. Um, at a height that is the one you anatomically use when you shoot the bow that is still superseded in part by the neck, the head, the back of the horse, right? So uh, this asymmetry was thought to uh, compensate uh, the, uh, let's say, the, the lack of the, the let's say, of, of room, of, of maneuvering, of flexion that you could, could not achieve with inferior part, right? So um, the, as a consequence also, the lower limb was proportionally built with a more rigid materia material, right? And we'll see in a while now the composition of the bow in, in, a, in a section proper. Um, so you had this less elastic part in, in, the, uh, in, in the inferior limb and then a longer and more flexible superior limb that could allow you to, to, to grow. Of course, this caused an inclination of the... Um, of, of the you know of the bow axis in the one of, of of the body of the chest when you were pulling it because the asymmetry produced an angle uh, right arising right of from the uh, from from the direction which you have to draw uh, with with the arm so the in the hanic bow so the hanic bow offered however also a decidedly superior power compared to the Scythian one. In fact, it was capable of shooting very long arrows, uh, up to 80 centimeters. The average was 70, all these bows more or less. And, um, and arrows that could be also provided with much more, much heavier heads. Yeah, consequently, as a consistent increase also of the, of the, of the range and the penetration capacity. Then there was the Avar bow that was introduced in the 6th century on the Danubian frontier for, I mean, self-evident reasons. And it was instead symmetrical, right? And it differed slightly, however, in profile and outline from the Hanek bow, uh, in spite of maintaining its power in barrier, right? Then there was also the Sasanian bow that was fundamentally similar. Uh, it was traditionally employed by the Persian enemies of Rome. And we're talking, however, of, of a broader family, right, that we can see, of course, coming from the steppe. Uh, if you wonder why the, the change happened in the past, it was a kind of an environmentalistic hypothesis now is being debunked. I mean, the idea that in the steppes there are less forests at a certain point, uh, in the West instead, in Europe, it was more forest, so the you know the 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 composite character of the uh, of the bow would be caused by this putting different other materials together in the step. Uh, while in Europe, you would just cut the wood and make it that simple. It has nothing to do with that, right? It has to do with the development of mounted warfare, right? The need of using that art uh, that that uh, that bow on on a horseback. Uh, the uh, the I mean the the fact that that automatically brings the tar the the horse under under target uh more frequently that that is something that you have to use also more handily um in a in a moving situation and and uh and this is all consequence of the different political and social structures of the steps that brought to the need of essentially all almost virtually all mounted armies compared to, to the west but the 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 point is not in fact it's plenty of those composite bows even in those areas of the steppes where it's rich in forests, so you could easily use the, uh, say, the western type. So if we were to make a section of a composite bow to understand better what, what it is this composition, in fact, about, uh, imagine looking at one, cutting one limb of this, this, um, 
this bow and uh, looking at this section frontally. So you would have fundamentally a central wooden core, right, that would run all through the length of the bow. That was the b the bows were normally like 120 centimeters long, more or less, um, and this wooden core had a, a rough surface to favor the gluing, right, of the other material. Uh, on the sides of this wooden core were in fact glued certain, uh, you know, two uh, on the opposite sides two respectively lats strips right of semicircular form of harder wood that would confer to the bow uh, let's say this let's say base of the section in the uh, because there would be more so the, the, the sides would be more solicited at that point in the space uh, so that they had to be fundamentally harder whereas however the, the, the most elastic part would be the the, the backbone of, of the bow as we've seen in the inner part. So in the space comprehended between these two lat strips were also applied over, let's say, looking at the section, say, mostly in the frontal part and in the rear part of the bow, a series of stripes, thin stripes of horn. Then on the superior part, so in the front, this is corresponding to the external face of the bow, that was the one more solicited by deflection, were glued uh, numerous layers of animal bowel, right, so to increase the elasticity further. Whereas in the opposite side, in the inner part, uh, in the posterior part, that was instead solicited, but by compression, because you, you draw the bow, this this thing in the back is gonna compress within the center, right, of the, the, where you're pulling, where, where it's, fl uh, it's flexing, it's, it's bending, right. It's said in, in the front you have something that is stretching out, right, so it ne needs to be more flexible. The back has to be hard, right. And in fact, in the back, we're applied uh, thicker horn layers, and the whole thing was bandaged by an external cloth or tender and thin wood structure applied by partially superimposed segments. So this is the you know the the magic if you want behind this. You can imagine the craft be behind this and uh, I believe there is still you know a good um, series of bows realized like this um, around the world just traditionally not just by you know rep replicas from uh, from ancient manuals and so on. we don't have also dramatic archaeological evidence of this stuff like the for late Roman times the archaeological evidence we base ourselves on is the Irzi bow that is that was found in the Bagots necropolis close to Dura Europus on the left bank of the Euphrates, between the, the dating back to the second, third century BC, right? Uh, the other has been recovered in uh, Shevkar in Hungary uh, in 1983. Um, another one is from Kumdaria, is China, basically. It, this is a bow from the third century, uh, typical of the Xiongnu. Right, um, and it's uh, considered also the progenitor of the Hanuk bow. In fact, uh, another one is that has been dug in um, in Carlin, in Britain. It's a Roman, um, late Roman uh, site, archaeological site. Uh, so, speaking of arrows, as we said before, reached a length between seventy and eighty centimeters. Um, some typical forms of the time were between the fifth and seventh century were hexagonal um or you know that this was somewhat typically hunnic at some point or triangular in a flat sense otherwise there was um they were trill they could be trilobated with either tang or or sleeve that is how they basically fixed them on, on the shaft um and the sections were either either 
like uh, flat, right? Uh, or uh, in fact, trilobated with three spiked cross sections. Uh, there are interesting other arrowheads uh, with uh, holes practiced symmetrically on the wings um, of the of this hip that uh, probably were designed to produce that uh, characteristic uh, hissing, let's say, uh, whistling uh, during the, the, the shot that was psychologically terrifying, considering what we said before, that it's about the collective employment of archery made the difference. Arch archery by itself doesn't solve uh, tactical situations. There are not armies out there that win battles just with missiles. Right? Missiles are usually the weak kind of, uh, of weapon. It doesn't matter how uh, performing these technologies are. By themselves you, you don't wipe out an enemy from the battlefield. Right? You can't soften him up considerably, but you have to smash through him. But still, this, in order to do that, it's not just a physical thing, it's predominantly a psychological effect. So imagine a standing nervously and loaded in, in adrenaline it is making you you know your heart exploding because of the, the, the heartbeat ha being bombarded with these with this hail of arrows that not just do not make you rest at any moment during the day or the night and you have always to stay prepared for something arriving against you uh, but they also start whistling and and you see and, and you hear this and imagine the noise of thousands of arrows pouring like that continuously, right? It, it's psychologically unnerving, devastating, and believe me, they did make a hell of a of a of an effect on the end, concrete damage to the enemy. There are interesting arrow heads from the other necropolis of Mechka, Budapest, dating to the seventh century, that provide interesting uh, evidence of the link of the uh, arrow has with the haft. Um, here it's all it's all uh, always either the tank or the sleeve. So the tank you actually fix the you know they have the spike at the bottom of the arrow that you fix in inside the section of the haft of the sh uh, of the haft, and then you basically tie it um, or glue it with I don't know precisely how to the uh, when you fix the the arrow firmly into the, uh, the arrowhead into the haft. Otherwise, it's a sleeve that is instead you 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 insert the haft I inside this sleeve that enters. Uh, I mean that that um, departs from 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 the base of of the arrow. And then, generally speaking, as far as I understand, the, the difference is also the aforementioned one between the uh, in cross section, right? Because the the sleeve is like a little cone, right? Um, and and therefore it doesn't immediately, I mean it has to have a, a larger base of, of, of the, uh, a larger section of the arrow to, to fit in the structure, right? Broadly speaking, how they were cast. Um, and therefore that pr produces the trilobated section that was also probably improved for, for that reason to be more effective, especially against um, against armor. I mean such cross sections are mostly designed triangular, eventually squared, thinking about the Middle Ages, to punch through the metal st uh, structure that flexes more uh, like that. Um, so, speaking of the quivers as well, we, we, we don't, I've, I don't think there is mu much evidence from, from this specific times surviving, but the Toxofaretra, as it was called, of uh, 6th century Roman army didn't have to be particularly different from the Scythian Goritos of classical age, right? And in war zone, consider that the bow had to be carried, ready for use, that is, already loaded, as it was said in Greek, theta menon, right? And that tells you how um, how quick you have to be to, to keep at bay the enemy but through arrow because at the end of the day as we were saying before uh, arrows arrow fight also you know uh, considering the thickness of it and it's in the same performance individual shots as we've seen it's impressive makes you stay away for a while right even if at that point w w what the the economy forces on on the battlefield is you know is uh, up to you right if you are going to be exposed to overwhelming enemy fires you you know it's gonna you know um, weaken you 
sensibly not to launch an attack to overwhelm the enemy in mass, you will, will probably be more likely to attack. Um, the enemy is at that point probably having you know those light archers running away, uh, making hit and run tactics to 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 tire you down at that level and not making you charge into anything and making you ever more tired. So um, otherwise, if you charge, uh, I mean, this depends, you you may not want to tire your heavy cavalry at that point, you will maybe send expandables in to be literally said wiped out by, by archer to make the enemies exhaust its own missile, I mean you know, it, it all depends on the situation, there is no standard uh, way you, you may want to do this, uh, can be even the opposite and alright, so this was pretty much it uh, we, as I said at the beginning, we will be talking about, uh, especially, yeah, I mean, Byzantine archery because it, it really has this fascinating uh, kind of mixed hybrid uh, synthesis uh, of military culture that uh, hardly any other people quite quite had so so closely, so so effective. So, um, if you want. Mm, mm, standard in terms of military culture just getting as much as you can from from the enemy uh, in terms of strengths and and, and knowledge know-how technology the, the same troopers as we've seen like like in this time and um, and also because it shows after all that um, this idea of the Eastern thing we have in, in our minds is actually much closer to us right it is most of 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 um, Eastern Europe, but even Central Europe or the Balkans, or the Central Mediterranean, surely had this stuff, right? They were more fitting, you know, the kind of the composite bow area that maybe than than the than the the, the Western one. So that um, it, it's part of of us, even when we want to detach ourselves a bit from from this exotic East. That at the end of the day is is the same place where we all we all came, I mean, in at least as dominant cultural groups. Um, anyhow, uh, for now, we stop it here. Just hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.